Next, from the Illinois Bar Association's annual dinner honoring the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Thomas Kilbride delivers a lighthearted speech to members of the Illinois Bar and the Illinois Judges Association. This runs about 40 minutes. All of you came tonight uh, to hear from Chief Justice Tom Kilbride, and none of you came to hear an introduction, so I'm not going to do very much of that. Uh, you know him so well, you don't need much of an introduction. I can't imagine a more accessible uh, Chief Justice, not just to bar presidents, but to all members of the bar. The Chief has been a wonderful ambassador for the court, but he is more than just an excellent communicator. Under his leadership, the court has made significant progress in a number of areas, including electronic record access, mentoring, juror questions in civil cases, cameras in the courtroom, e-filing, access to justice, including the recent creation of the Access to Justice Commission, IPI jury instructions online, mandatory judicial actions, among other initiatives. And I know that we will see more accomplishments it before his term ends in October. In fact, word has it that Chief Justice Kilbride is boarding a plane tomorrow for Washington to resolve the budget crisis. <laughs> See if you can talk that. Uh, before the commencement of my term as president of the Illinois State Bar Association, I talked to the chief about our plan for the ISBA to devote attention this year to one of his passions. Uh, and that is the need for adequate court funding. He was very encouraging of our efforts. In fact, he agreed to contribute an article that was just published in the November issue of the Illinois Bar Journal. Uh, and the article was titled, The High Price of Low Funding. This article was just the kind of call to arms that we have needed to engage the bar and the public on this very important issue, letting them know that status quo cannot continue if we are to have truly divided government. In the Chief's words, the courts are not an agency or department providing a government service, but an equal constitutional branch conducting a vital function of our government. What a great message to take. Yes, you can applaud. <laughs> what, a, what an excellent message to take to our government officials, to our communities, to our schools, and to their civics classes, to our service clubs, and yes, to the media, and to all parts in between. And it is so much better, so much better, because it came from a leader at the top of Illinois' most important court. This is the kind of leader that we have in Tom Kilbride. Ladies and gentlemen, I present the Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court, Thomas L. Kilbride. Thank you very much. As John just said, uh, people are standing up and I haven't said anything yet. <laughs> so I'm reminded uh, of the old saying that uh, with a, those great introductions, that really warm and generous introductions, both by Aurora and now President John, I don't look forward to disappointing you. <laughs> I, uh, he said I'm an excellent communicator. That's, that's very kind of you. I hope, I hope you find that true tonight. Uh, as I told uh, some folks, I, I've had a, a long-term uh, fantasy about these Supreme Court dinners. And I had uh, wanted to learn how to play a musical instrument. <laughs> and take a new approach. Stand up here, say a few words, and then pull out the instrument and start playing. <laughs> well, I didn't accomplish that. Oh, they're gone. They're not going to help me out. <laughs> so I got the iPhone as they talked, and I've got iTunes, and i got playlists, and I thought I was going to do a playlist and, and play the favorite top six songs on my walk list every day about tie one to Justice Thomas and the group. And I haven't told him what I was going to do, but I decided I couldn't pull that off. <sighs> Great plans, how they come together. I talked to the band leader about this. 
I told them I always wanted to learn how to play the saxophone, and then boom, they would play the saxophone. But they're God. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to say uh, I do really appreciate uh, those introductions tonight, and uh, uh, there's something that was not said about Aurora uh, at the time of her CBA installation of the president. Uh, she is the first Filipina to lead the Chicago Bar Association, and I want to acknowledge her for that. Now, as soon as I say that, I realize I've ventured into a territory where I have to acknowledge other people. And I never know where to draw the line. And I was reminded after the December 3rd uh, swearing in oath ceremony that I probably should have acknowledged some other new judges in the class of 34 new circuit judges. And one was Jessica Arong O'Brien, who's also the first Filipina to be elected. And then there's Patricia Leeming, who's uh, Pakistani, first elected Pakistani. And I'm the first Irish guy to be up here for a while. <laughs> but I, I want you to know that I really did, uh, oh, you're back, okay, thanks a lot. Here, here's the cue. <laughs> and don't count that against my time, okay? Uh, Mary got a great introduction, didn't she? You don't, you don't have to applaud at everything, you know, but... Uh, but uh, <laughs> and one of my great uh, fantasies has been learn how to play the saxophone. <laughs> I'm trying to remember that line from the Butch uh, Cassidy and Sundance Kid, that movie. I love it when a plan comes together. But I have to tell you, I have to admit, um, and before I do that, let me back up. I want to thank uh, Terry Murphy. I want to thank Bob Craighead, who's in the back, and Kim Weaver for your wonderful hospitality. Uh, and, you know, just standing here tonight is really a daunting challenge because, uh, look, it's a mixed crowd, and I mean mixed because there's lawyers and non-lawyers and the spouses and significant others of lawyers who are not lawyers, such as Gail Tangarelli, who's married to Judge Tangarelli, told me, you know, it's late to start with. You're not going to talk too long, are you? <laughs> Listen, I didn't have anything to do with the schedule here tonight, all right? Before the dinner, there's this long reception of pre-dinner cocktails that causes a lot of collateral consequences for somebody <laughs> who has to speak in front of this crowd. It's a festive mood. And uh, John Tice, not John Thies, <laughs> the other night your wife told me a very interesting comment. She said every morning when she's awakened, because she gave the speech last year, she said every morning the first thing I do is I think about you, Tom. That's because I have to give the speech. She doesn't. <laughs> and by the way, this is not a speech. You know, and I uh, asked around for some help from the audience to figure out what's a good topic to talk about. And of course, I didn't get any help. I didn't come up with any, any topic per se. Uh, Joe Tiger, our communications director, he is fabulous. He said, uh, just don't be too long. Judge Albrecht, who I, I saw her on November 30th when I swore in four county officials down there, she didn't know I was going to be the, the, the dinner speaker, and she says, well, you know, those dinners are so boring, and they're so long. <laughs> and then back in 2004, that's when I gave my first uh, set of comments, uh, Marty Healy, who's uh, Martin Healy, the Healy Law Firm, good friend and actual personal lawyer for me, uh, his wife Joanne I don't know if she came in 2004, and I, I asked him for some, some suggestions, and he said, well, how about uh, Rule 213 and expert witnesses? <laughs> so I didn't ask Marty tonight what, what I should talk about. And in fact, I can tell you what I said 2004, because I thought about just rolling out my speech from 2004. How many of you would remember from eight years ago? But uh, uh, I would have been bored, and I think all of you would have been bored. But uh, I do want to do a shout out for uh, a guy here, Judge Allen, 
from uh, Will County, 12th Circuit, who's a good friend of mine. He and his wife, Nora, are here only because I'm here, and that's not what it's all about, but uh, he and his wife were very instrumental in helping me get elected so I could be here, not only in 2000, but also in 2010. And I want to thank them, uh, uh, so give them a round of applause. And I wasn't asked to say what I'm going to say, and I'm not trying to violate any ISBA rules when it comes to electioneering or campaigning, so I'm not going to say what I'd like to say. But another guy who helped me tremendously uh, in 2010 for the retention, the boots on the ground uh, kind of guy, that's Dennis Lynch in Mark Marty Healy's office. I'm going, to, I'm going to get through this introduction here in a few minutes, by the way, but uh, I want to acknowledge that this morning, uh, there were two uh, exceptional people who received awards from the Illinois Bar Foundation. One was Mark Hess, whom we all love. And, uh, and uh, those of us on the court, and I hope all of you also love my colleague, Justice Garman, who also received an award. And not, not to be outdone, but uh, at lunch, the Illinois Judges Association, Judge Justice Carol Pope, and Gino DeVito, who was sitting, I saw him earlier here, both received awards as well. But um, And I have to tell you, after listening, for those of you who were at the IJA luncheon listening to Brian Stevenson talk, I almost wilted like a flower on a hot day. That guy was just absolutely tremendous, and uh, I'm not... Uh, I don't know what to say. I can't even match that guy. I don't think he spoke with one note in front of him. He's like a, a preacher, and uh, I'm going to, not that not that Barack Obama would listen to me, but I'd like to nominate him for the next vacancy on the U.S. Supreme Court. The guy's tremendous. But tonight, I'm not going to uh, challenge fate. Our one daughter, Colleen, I didn't even tell Mary about this, but she called me earlier this evening. I was going through these notes trying to figure out exactly what to say, and she said, we talked, and Colleen's 25. And I don't know if Judge Grace Dickler's here. Are you here, Grace? Um, for those of you around for the December 3rd oath ceremony, you discovered I don't know how to speak Spanish very well. It's a different story. I'll tell you that later, maybe. But uh, she's the one who speaks fluent Spanish. And she said, Dad, I got a great story for you. And it's not in Spanish, by the way. But um, she said, uh, and, and Mary and I have been married. I don't know how this is possible. No, no disrespect to Mary, but we're coming up on 30 years. And, <clears throat> And, and I'm tempted, but I'm not going to do this. I, I told, I learned one of the best jokes of my entire life from my brother, colleague, uh, Justice Bob Thomas, who told a story about the Italian couple who were married for 50 years, but I'm not going to tell that today. <laughs> I, I, there, during the retention campaign, I used it all the time. In fact, I don't know Ed and, uh, and uh, Ann Burke remember this, uh, Justice Burke, Honorable Ed Burke, but at a fundraiser that was at their home, I, I, I gave the story that night, and I'm and, but I'm not going to tell it, unless you beg me to tell it later on. But, but no, 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 no. But I uh, forgot where the heck I was going with this. But Colleen said, here's a, here's a joke for you, Dad. So I figured, okay, great, I'll listen to this. It's actually, I thought, pretty funny. I don't know how well I'll deliver it. But she said it's the couple who were married for 45 years. And the dad calls up his one son, Joe, Joey, you know, Ricky, Kenny, Rusty, those guys, Johnny. Uh, he says, uh, uh, Joe? I'm getting divorced from your, your mother. It's been 45 years, I can't stand it. I can't talk to her, I can't look at her, it's over. And he says, oh God, Dad, don't tell me that, please don't. He says, in fact, I, I can't, I'm not even gonna tell your daughter. So you call Mary Pat, you tell her. So Joey calls Mary Pat and tells her the same thing. Mary Pat says, Dad, no, you can't do this. Don't do anything, we're gonna be home on the next flight. So Dad, hangs up the phone, he smiles, he looks at his wife, he says, it worked. <laughs> he, said, he said, they're coming home, and the best thing about it for Christmas is they're gonna pay their own airfare. <laughs> now that's just the first part of my introduction here. Uh, <clears throat> I've got a lot to say tonight, it's been eight years, okay? Sorry, Gail. <laughs> But I'm not going to say it all tonight. Um, and I can't deliver a, uh, what I refer to as a speech uh, the way uh, 
my brother colleague, uh, Ju Justice Bob Thomas again. Uh, these are remarks only. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not as funny as that guy. Uh, I didn't play football for Notre Dame. I didn't play football for the Chicago Bears. But when I was in college at Illinois State University, I played basketball and had the record for the consecutive free throws in the intramural league. <laughs> You can just laugh, you don't have to clap. But uh, I do, do want to share uh, something that uh, I thought reminded me when I was talking to Michael Bergman from Pilly, the Public Interest Law Initiative, that just about two weeks ago, I think it was on Thursday or Tuesday, Thursday, two weeks ago, uh, Judge uh, Edmund, if it's Edmund, I think Chang, on the Federal District Court spoke, and he was a Pilly intern, and he uh, thanked the Board of Examiners for his passage as an attorney. Now, he's an aeronautical engineer before he became a lawyer. That means he was a rocket scientist. <laughs> I, on the other hand, have no, have no other degrees, and I still am amazed to this day that the passing rate, fortunately, was 90% when I took the bar, and I passed. I'm still shocked to this day because I'm lousy when it comes to standardized tests. So for those in the board of the bar examiners who are here, thank you very much. <laughs> But I want to say this to my colleagues. If you remember last year, Justice Tice spoke to each one of us. And uh, you're wondering if I'm going to do that. Well, I thought maybe I might do that before the night's over. But uh, usually when they're at the head table, they're giving a talk. Of course, one of the nice things about being at this event is when you don't have to give the talk and you can sit back and relax and enjoy the evening and have a glass of wine or two, uh, or three, as the case may be. But uh, so I'm going to make some comments, but I'm going to sprinkle it throughout the night so I can hopefully keep their interest and their attention. But first off the bat, I want to talk briefly about Justice Garman and Justice Burke. You know, I'm a father of uh, three daughters, and uh, Mary and I are. Well, she's not the father. She's the mother. <laughs> but uh, uh, <laughs> I have the delightful, I, no, really, this is true. I'm trying to be very respectful about this. So. <laughs> I have the delightful uh, distinction to be uh, one of the, the male colleagues on the court who have served for the first time ever with three women on the Illinois Supreme Court. And Justice Garman and Justice Burke have anchored our court in the work of the historical heritage of, of government and history and the court. and. Uh, and speaking of those two, I just want to, I'm going to tie this back together, but this morning I learned, you know, Rita, she knows I do this all the time, Justice Garman, excuse me, uh, she uh, was the valedictorian of her high school. I, on the other hand, were, were part of the class as Judge Wilbur Johnson, God bless his soul, rest in peace. Some of us had to make the upper half of the class possible. <laughs> Not only was she the valedictorian, I found out this morning at the Illinois Bar Foundation event that when she was at the University of Illinois, she received the bronze tablet. I don't know how many of you know what that is. That's the top 1% of the graduating class, the top bronze tablet. Now, I don't know about all my other colleagues, but at least I know to the right these two guys, Justice Bob Thomas and Justice Armeyer, uh, we didn't get any tablets. <laughs> but, but... The only tablet the three of us share in, in common is we all have iPads. <laughs> Not only do we have iPads, I noticed tonight that Justice Carmeyer brought his with him, and he helped me find out the right pronunciation for, for uh, Gail uh, Tangarelli. It's still not the <laughs> correct Italian pronunciation, I'm sure, but uh, that's how, how, how we've done so far. <laughs> but uh, I, wanna, I do want to compliment Justice Garman and Justice Burke because they've, they've really done a fabulous job in ensuring that we don't forget our lessons of history that are not lost or forgotten. But really, I have to comment on this. Uh, during the November term when we were in session, uh, Justice Burke primarily, although Justice Garman participated as a co-conspirator, for those of you who remember that movie about the Mary Surratt, <laughs> Uh, they, had a, they had a historical showing of, uh, uh, of historical dress, yeah. garments that women wore. Justice Thomas, Justice Freeman, and I uh, did not attend. But our colleague, Justice Carmeyer, the dapper dresser that he is, 
dashing good looks, he went to that event. And the report that Justice Garmin and Justice Burke came back with, Mary, I hope you're listening, is that the, lo the women all loved him. <laughs> they were so impressed that he was there. But I have to tell you something else that I'm very concerned about. Um, Justice Garmin and Justice Burke had been real co-conspirators. They, they put on two events. One was the uh, uh, retrial of Mary Surratt. She was the one who was the convicted co-conspirator of the Lincoln assassination. And, and, and after that, they put on the one with the, the retrial of Mary Todd Lincoln's sanity commitment hearing. Now, pay attention here. Mary Surratt, Mary, emphasis on Mary Todd Lincoln. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But it's no surprise that when I went to see the, the Lincoln movie with my wife, Mary, in the credits, the Steven Spielberg, shortly after his name, popped up Ann Burke and Rita Garman. I thought you'd find that to be funny. <laughs> but despite their tireless and work in rehabilitating the reputations of these two Marys, of historical value, I really started to worry earlier tonight when I saw both of them speaking intently with my wife Mary, <laughs> wondering are they going to try and put on some kind of new retrial about why she was nuts enough to, to marry me. <laughs> I don't know how we've lasted this long, Not, it's all because of her, she has great tolerance. But I want to say this and I'll conclude with my introduction, shall we say. I hope you're okay, <laughs> Gail, but uh, being here in Chicago tonight, uh, when I started finally, and this was a moving deadline, when I was going to get around to putting together my, my comments for tonight, I actually started working on it last weekend for part of a day, and that was the only time I worked on it. And uh, it was uh, uh, Saturday morning when I woke up, I uh, realized that it was 40 years ago on December 8th, last week, a week ago, Friday, when I moved to Chicago. I was actually a resident of the city of Chicago. I was 19 years old. I was a uh, uh, whipper snapper, as they say, and uh, I actually at that time had the ability to compete with a full head of hair with Justice Jesse Reyes. <laughs> I was, uh, I thought that'd get a better laugh too, but I was, uh, I was young and strong, as they say back then, and I came to the city to work as a community organizer. God forbid. <laughs> My political consultants would hear me say that, but I want you to know I did that before that other guy, <laughs> Barry Obama, came here to Chicago. But that's another story for another day. But what I do want to share with you, uh, and, and, and you've got to stay with me because I promise I've got a good story for you that, that I'm going to finish with at the end. Uh, but uh, I wanted to talk about what's happened just briefly. Three points. One, about the last eight years. Now, I'm not going to go through it year by year. I want to talk about, secondly, what's going on with the court right now. And third, I want to talk about the future as I look at Justice Michael Hyman. And I'm going to come back to that as well. But, um, you know, we've had a tremendous amount of change in our lives in just the last eight years. Uh, the White Sox won the World Series. <laughs> See, Joe Tyver now knows I'm not talking too long. Uh, the Cardinals won twice the World Series. And the Cubs, well, things just don't change. But in technology, it's been a tremendous revolution and evolution. It's probably been the most evolutionary change we've seen in the last eight years. It was eight years ago when stock for Google went public at a price of $85. Today, it, it, it trades at over 650 Apple was then trading for $70. Today, it's gone down recently. It's 500 some plus. It was over 1,000 just a few months ago. Uh, there were really no smartphones. The revolution had not started. And many of you today, I would venture to say, as I pulled this out of my pocket, many of us have smartphones in our pockets today, computers that are more powerful uh, than anything available back in 2004. Today, we've got tablets, uh, iPads, cloud technology, integration software, et cetera, et cetera, the YouTube and, and all that. And what that means for the court is that it's time for us to not only adapt and react, but we need to plan uh, for the future. And one of the things we're doing to plan for the future is that come January 1, we are launching 
a new initiative to allow e-filing in any circuit in any county in the state of Illinois. Uh, but here's what I want to talk about what makes it difficult for us to, to plan and, uh, for the future, to do what we want to do right now. And I'm going to be very brief about this. I talked about it more extensively earlier this morning at the MCLE uh, seminar that the lawyer legislators called that, called that uh, MCLE credit for bribery. They thought they would come and we'd give them an hour and a half of credit and, and uh, they'd give us more money. But uh, then Jack Frank says, oh, I want at least three hours. And then he said, oh, I want 30 hours. And I said, well, if you give us that 30 million that we're short, we'll give you those three, 30 hours of credit. <laughs> but here's a shocking fact that, because uh, I dare say many of you probably didn't get a chance to read that article. The entire budget in the state of Illinois for all the, everything that goes on is 57 billion dollars. Do you know what our court budget is? The one-third separate branch of government, a co-equal branch? 281 million, 87,000 and 100 dollars. Now Matt, Mary's the math teacher. I didn't do this calculation so I hope I'm not right. Wrong, I mean. But I'm told that that is less than one-half of one percent of the entire state budget. So here's the point. We're in dire straits in the state of Illinois, but they're not going to fix it by cutting our budget. They could make a rounding error and go up and give us exactly what we want, but they don't do that. In fact, they've cut us year after year after year after year. We've had consistent cuts in our budget for 10 years, 11, 12 years now, and it's begun to not only trim the branches off the trunk of the tree, but they're chopping into the trunk of our tree. And the area that hurts the most is probation. And again, I'm not going to go into all that, but. Uh, it's something we're going to try and address. Second thing I wanted to talk about as far as what's going on right now that I am uh, enthusiastic about is our recently established Illinois Supreme Court Commission on Access to Justice. And it was enthusiastically and unanimously approved by the court. We rolled it out in June. We became the 29th state in the nation, in the country, to have an access commission. And in the last six months, we have made tremendous progress. I mean, nuts and bolts. There's not a committee, not a commission that sits around talking. They're doing things. And there's a lot of those people in this room tonight who are doing those things. And I want to thank Justice Tice for giving us Jeffrey Coleman, who's not here because his mother's gravely ill. But Jeff is a, uh, a real workhorse. And I know some of his colleagues are here. I told him, make sure you tell him what I had to say about him, because he is absolutely, unquestionably, not only a workhorse, he's a guy who gallops, he doesn't plot along, and he has exceptional leadership. He's really a Kentucky Derby bluegrass thoroughbred, and I can't tell you how grateful we are to have him. And I want to thank the rest of my colleagues on the court for giving us. It's really turned out to be a, an unusual amalgamation of wonderful people, both judges and lawyers, who have come together to be on that commission. And just to give you a snapshot, uh, we have already in the last six months established a language access committee and Judge Laura Liu, who was recently elected to the Circuit Court, the first Chinese woman to be elected to the uh, Circuit Court of Cook County. She and Judge Grace Dickler are chairing that uh, committee. We've uh, passed a new rule on standardized forms to establish mandatory uniform forms in the state of Illinois. We now have a, committ a committee uh, on training for court personnel to deal with the problem called the counter encounter. Most people who first come to the courthouse have their encounter with the court system at the clerk's <laughs> office or also nowadays dealing with the uh, deputy sheriffs going through security. So we're launching training to deal with those kinds of, uh, uh, you know, bringing the, I don't like to talk about Walmart, but you know, the, the greeters, <laughs> to, to be a little more friendly, to be user friendly to folks coming into the courthouse. We have a Dean's Advisory Committee. There's nine, I hope I'm right about this, nine law schools in the state of Illinois. And last week, we had a committee meeting with the deans. We had five in person, uh, three on the phone, and the, and the ninth, uh, I hope that adds up tonight. Uh, couldn't make it because of uh, an unexpected emergency. Great participation. October 24th, we had the first annual conference. And this gets a little more serious. Uh, and all the members of the court, God love you all. I appreciate your participation and attendance. We were there for the first conference. And we had uh, presiding justice Jess Dickinson 
from the Missouri, Mississippi Supreme Court uh, talked to us. And it was a fabulous, absolutely fabulous conference. And the commission is really undergoing an in-depth examination of how our system operates, how we can improve what we do to help the people living in poverty, those with disabilities, those with language barriers, those without lawyers, without representation. And one of the things that came out of that commission, and, and I am looking for a laugh on this one, uh, on December 3rd at the uh, swearing-in ceremony, I, I shouted out Judge Laura Liu, and, and she had commented at the Access Commission, and this is not to be critical of the county, but the only bilingual sign in the Daly Center was a Spanish sign in Spanish that, that has two words. And I messed up the, the Spanish word and, uh, for judge. But it says judges only. And of course, on December 3rd, it was past 11 o'clock. Sometimes I think with my stomach, I was getting hungry. And so instead of saying, and don't shout it out, I might get it wrong. I think it's Oasis, close, Jesse, for judge. I said huevos. <laughs> huevos rancheros. <laughs> So, so much for that. But uh, we were reminded at that conference, and this is, I think, important for all of us as lawyers and the non-lawyers alike, that we know this from our history, that the opening lines of our United States Constitution say that we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is that we, the people of these states, to form a more perfect union, the first thing we do is establish justice. And that's what this commission is about. But why is that so challenging? Why is that so difficult? Because here in Illinois, this is an example. We only have about 406 full-time legal aid lawyers to handle indigent civil defense, not defendants, civil clients. There are over now one in three people in the state of Illinois who are deemed either poor or low income based on the federal poverty guidelines. Guess what that ratio is? It's one full-time lawyer per 7,600 potential clients. That's impossible. And here's what it boils down to is that nothing gets solved unless those with the power and the influence take ownership problems and make, make it their issue. And that's what we're trying to do with the full court, with the Access to Justice Commission. And I don't think John uh, Levy is here tonight. I don't think I saw him from Sidley and Austin. One of our own here in Chicago is the president of the National Legal Services Corporation Board. And he and his uh, partner in crime, co-conspirator Jim Sandman, who's the president, said, <clears throat> we have to grab a hold of this issue in this country to get it fixed. And uh, he speaks very poignantly about it to say that, uh, and it's a great contrast. You don't have to be a lawyer to get this, Gail. <laughs> uh, and I'm not picking on you. I, I don't know you that well, but I love you. <laughs> I might send you a Valentine's Day card. <laughs> Maybe you'll send me one. Uh, but the pursuit, the constitutional concept of pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness is something that the fortunate to get to do. And by the way, I've looked. I don't find any cases dealing with the pursuit of happiness. We've got lots of cases on life and liberty, but there's no constitutional holding on the pursuit of happiness. I don't know what's up with that. But those who are fortunate get to pursue happiness. Those of us who are not, who are less fortunate, our pursuit is economic survival. It's about talking about a roof over our head. It's about making sure that food is on the table, the ability to free to be free from domestic violence and the ability to keep our families together. And pro bono is one of the answers and, and at the Pilly luncheon, Judge Edmund Chang reminded all of us lawyers there that day that the word professional, what's inherent to that definition is pro bono. And I, I've spoken twice to the LAP, the Lawyers Assistance Program, and it was the only time I thought I could use this line that I heard during the campaign trail, I was out driving myself around the 3rd District back before the 2000 election, a country western song by Martina McBride where she says, love is the only house big enough for all the pain in the world. Love is the only house big enough for all the pain in the world. And I think that's a beautiful line. I can't sing. I can't play the saxophone. I can't sing. 
at least not very well. But, um, but we as professionals can love people by professionally writing pro bono work. And I wish all of you could have heard Brian Stevenson today talk. He's a full-time uh, professional lawyer for the people, for folks who don't otherwise have representation. And to me and to many, the best public manifestation of what is good about our legal profession, of who we are, of what we are as professionals, is to provide pro bono services. So in the words of John Levy from Sid Sidley in Austin, thinking about Martina McBride, uh, let's get loving, as they say. So I, I don't know how we're doing on time, but I want you to know I'm almost done, OK? Uh, to talk about the future, to talk about the future. I, I missed that, by the way. Um, we, oh, yeah. Oh, I forgot. Mary gave me a good line. She said, I should have used, I should have used uh, Aurora's comment about, he's sick. <laughs> and you should have heard what she said when Aurora said I was sick. So do you have an idea how sick he is? <laughs> and I thought I could stand up and say, you know what? I'm sick. I got to go. Nice. Have a nice night. So I'm ready to say I'm sick, have a nice night. But we, uh, through the leadership of uh, Justice, formerly, I guess you're still judge, you haven't got justice quite yet. Michael Hyman, who's a great friend and a great lawyer, uh, the court established a strategic planning committee of the Judicial Conference. And one of the functions we're doing is to plan a future of the court's conference that's coming up in the month of April 2013. And two of your former presidents of the ISBA, Tim Birchie and Tim Eaton, are also on that committee. And I want to thank them. I want to thank Michael Hyman. OK, here it is. This is the last thing I got to say. It's going to take a minute or two, Joe. I know you're anxious to go. But uh, I thought, as the father of three daughters, I'm always being reminded about, don't forget about the women. We, and with this, I, I'm the first chief to be able to preside over a court comprised of three women on the Illinois Supreme Court. And that means, guys, we're only one away from them taking control of the court. <laughs> so I wanted to say, you know, my wife and others are always reminding me about, you know, women, we're, and you are. I mean, I, listen, I, I understand. I don't, I don't match up. Multitasking. I mean, I'm still trying to, to master monotasking. But women are everywhere. They really are. They are. Why do you find that funny? Paula, you would. Uh, you're in this, by the way. You're in this. Poor Jim Holderman. Last night. Oh, on the bus. On the bus. He's telling us. He's getting these text messages, emails from Paula. Just a general reminder, take out the garbage. <laughs> But women are everywhere. Laura Bellos, one of our own, president of the ABA Association. Aurora Abella Austriaco, president of the CBA. Paula Hudson Holderman, the incoming president of the ISBA. And uh, Deborah Walker, president of the Illinois Bar Foundation. And now this is, comes as no surprise, but Deanne Brown, who's here tonight, was the president of the Women's Bar Association. <laughs> and Karen Zebecki DeHayes is the current president, but I, I love that organization. And what I've got to say here in a minute is what I said at the June uh, meeting when they gave me a, an award named after a woman. Uh, uh, Marion Cruz, Filipino, is the president of the Asian American Association. And, and Jessica Arong O'Brien, now judge, uh, told me that the last seven presidents of that Asian American Bar Association have all been women. The 34 new circuit judges, 19, maybe 20, because I, I'm not sure if I got the count right, are women. And of course, we have. Mary Surratt from the retrial. We have Mary Todd Lincoln. We have the, the three powerful women on the Illinois Supreme Court, Justice Garman, Justice Burke, Justice Tice. And at my home, there's Kate, Colleen, Claire, and now there's my granddaughter, Isabel. And not to be outdone, there's Mary. <laughs> and for those of you who were at the June Women's Bar Association, my barber, who happens to be a woman, Colleen, uh, had this on her mirror on the counter. It's a classic example of multitasking. And I'm going to conclude with this. Five tips for a woman. 
Now remember at the Women's Bar Association that was predominantly women, I got a great round of applause. <laughs> this is a mixed crowd, so you still gotta help me out. Number one, it's important that a man helps you around the house and has a job. <laughs> Number two, it's important that a man makes you laugh. Number three, it's important to find a man you can count on and does not lie to you. Number four, it's important that a man loves you and spoils you. And number five, I wish they were here for the drum roll, it's important that these four men don't know each other. <laughs> Thank you. You're watching the Illinois Channel an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. 